The broadcast is now starting. All attendees. Good morning, good afternoon, only. and good evening. My name is Don Jones. Welcome to this PowerShell.org tech session. Ditch Excel. There's an easier way to do trend reports. Just one brief bit of housekeeping before we continue. If you have got a question, please use the question and answer panel right within the GoToWebinar control panel to submit your question. You can submit your question at any time during the presentation. I will try and keep an eye on that out of the corner of my eye, and I will try to take uh, your questions as we come to them rather than waiting until the end. So please don't wait until the end. If you've got a question, pop it in there as soon as it occurs to you, and I'll try and pick it up at an appropriate time. So Ditch Excel, there's an easier way to do trend reports. Here we go. Uh, keep in mind, you can always find the latest tech sessions on PowerShell.org, and here's the URL to do that. We do announce them about a month to two months out. Uh, at that point, you can sign up. You do have to register in advance if you want to attend the live event, and that is the only place to participate in questions and answers. And recordings are posted to the PowerShell.org YouTube channel, usually within about 48 hours. Big thanks to Nicholas Getchell, who's out there helping us plan future tech sessions, as well as handle the recording and scheduling. And if you would like to present a tech session, we would certainly love to hear from you. You don't have to be an expert or a guru. Just share some PowerShell problem that you solved, help everybody else get past that too. Um, anything you find interesting, probably lots of other folks would find interesting too. And doing something like a tech session is a fantastic way to uh, sort of make sure you've really cemented the skills in your own mind. You can find information about contacting uh, Nicholas to schedule a tech session on the tech sessions page right on PowerShell.org. So today, kind of the overall theme is, I see a lot of people a lot of times, uh, particularly in the forums at PowerShell.org, asking questions about programming Excel. And when you dig in, a lot of times what they're trying to do is store trend information or historical data in an Excel spreadsheet, mainly because Excel has got such fantastic capabilities for producing charts. Well, the problem is that Excel sucks, at least from a programming perspective. I mean, yay charts, we all love charts, but programming Excel is really complicated and really hard. And you wind up spending an awful lot of time just manipulating data back and forth because at the end of the day, it is not a reporting tool, nor is it a database. We can do better. For example, SQL Server is free, at least the Express Edition, and honestly, you know that most of you probably have got some SQL Server running around in your environment someplace that you could get a little bit of data space, space on if you needed to. So it's also very easy to code against. It includes very powerful reporting tools. In fact, even the Express version of SQL Server, which is what I will be using today in demonstrations, comes in an advanced services edition. It is still free and it includes SQL Server reporting services. SQL Server is a wonderful place to store historical and trend data. I think a lot of the reason people tend to try and go with CSV files or Excel spreadsheets instead of SQL Server is there's this perception that SQL Server is difficult and it is not. In fact, I'm gonna show you a, a module that you'll be able to use to make it even easier. If you can run ping, you can store data in SQL Server, I absolutely promise. So why spend all that time getting Excel just to show you a chart when SQL Server can do it with a lot less code, meaning less work for you? And if you're using the big version of SQL Server, in other words, not the free one, you can even have it automatically deliver reports. You can take yourself completely out of the loop. You can write a script, run it as a scheduled task that dumps data into SQL Server on whatever basis you need to, and you can let SQL Server generate reports and deliver them via email or a website automagically. This is way better than anything you've been doing with Excel, way more powerful and easier. Now, specifically what we're talking about here is SQL Server Reporting Services or SSRS. It is present in all editions of SQL Server that you're going to be using. The only time you won't find it is if you get the Express SQL Server without advanced services. Microsoft mainly makes that available because it's a smaller download, but if you get the advanced services install, it includes reporting services. Now, SRS Express, SSRS Express is a bit, not dumped down, dumbed down. It doesn't offer the automatic delivery. It doesn't really have some of the self-service functionality, 
but you probably already have reporting services running on a SQL server in your org somewhere. All you need is for someone to be able to use that. You don't even have to store your database on the same server as reporting services. You can run your express edition to keep your data in, and you can put that anywhere you want to, and reporting services on a completely different machine can connect to it for reports. Now, the neat thing about the, the full commercial paid version of SQL Server reporting services is that it includes an end user website. And you're going to see kind of the dumbed down version of that today. But it, got, it has more powerful report designing tools. And here's the big one, automatic delivery of report subscriptions. Users can go in, see the reports you've created. They can subscribe to them and they will be automatically delivered and you can take yourself completely out of the loop. It is the perfect way to do these things. So today's focus is going to be on getting data into SQL Server so that SSRS can do its magic. That is going to be easy. I'm actually going to walk you through the tool that I use to do that so you understand how it works because frankly, I'm, I'm pretty proud of the tool. It's got some pretty awesome technique in it, but you can also just kind of mumble to yourself and close your eyes while we go through that. But if you're, if you're not, not interested, you can just use the tool for what it is. Now, the one downside, everything I'm going to be covering today is really SQL Server specific. What we're showing will not adapt very easily to other relational database management systems, but it's still better than Excel and you can still use the Express version. So you don't have to pay for this stuff. Keep that in mind. Now, just to kind of give you some, some context, I am going to be showing you a little bit of SQL Server reporting services. I, I wanted to because it is really where the magic comes in this whole process, but I am not super report creation man. There are a lot of SSRS books out there. If you want to dig further, there's this website, um, amazon.com. That's it. They sell books and stuff, and you'll find lots of SQL Server reporting services books if you want to dig further. But the neat thing about this approach is you have the ability to populate a database and let someone else build reports on it. Because dealing with reports is a lot like dealing with users and I try to stay away from users because they give me a rash. So this lets you separate yourself from the whole reporting thing. You just put the data in the right place and let other people build reports off of it. Now, some follow-up resources uh, for afterwards, because I know you're going to have questions about where this stuff comes from. This webinar and the SQL reporting module, so everything we're talking about in this, can be found in the Trend and Historical Reports free ebook on PowerShell.org. So every, every technique I'm going to show you, every walkthrough, this is all inspired from that book. And the PowerShell module that I'll be using and showing to you is also found with that ebook. The report designer tool that I'll be showing you can be found on download.microsoft.com by searching for report designer. It's a separate download. It does not come with SQL Server. Finally, you can also get SQL Server Express from download.microsoft.com. What you'll want to make sure you do though is when you click download, make sure you're grabbing the version that is with advanced services. It is usually the largest of the downloads. And I'll go over that information again when we finish, but for now, Let's hop into some demo. So to give you a little bit of context, uh, here is SQL Server Management Studio. I'll just wait for this to come up on the webinar. There we go, sorry about all the animation. And you can see here that I have created a, a database called PowerShell. Now, if you look under the tables folder there, it is completely empty. So there are no tables. I have not done anything other than create a database and I have chosen to call it PowerShell. You don't have to call it PowerShell. You can call it whatever you want to. This is the last time we have to look at SQL Management Studio, although we may come back to it later just to prove a point or two. Let me bump the font size on this up just a bit so it's a little clearer for, to you perhaps. So I'm here in the ISE and I'm looking at a module called SQL Reporting. SQL reporting is the module that comes with the creating historical and trend reports ebook. So that's where you can get this code. And the big thing in here is a function called save report data. You will notice that it's got several parameters. One of them is input object. So we're going to pipe things to this. And the other is local express database name. 
Meaning if you are running SQL express on the same machine where you run this script, that's all you need is just to provide the database name. Now, remember in my case, the database name was PowerShell. That's what I created in SQL server. Alternately, if you want to run this script on one machine and keep your data on a different machine, you'll use the minus connection string parameter. And then you just have to provide a legal connection string to a SQL server database. And that connection string can include username and password. You can let it use your logon credentials. All the regular connection stringy stuff goes there. We're going to be working with the local express database name. So before we go any further, I'm going to pop out of here because that's all I want you to know right now. We're going to, we're going to dig into this just a little bit later. Um, oh, we got a question. Um, how many of these scripts are only for 2012 server and what will work on 2008 R2? Everything I'm showing you will work on just about every version of SQL server ever invented that has SQL server reporting services. Absolutely nothing here is tied to 2012. Most of this will work on SQL server seven. We just didn't have reporting services all that far back. So you're going to be able to use this in a lot of places. So to start, I'm going to figure out what type of data I want to collect. And because one of the things that you want to collect trend reports on is disk space. And because disk space is an easy thing to do, I'm going to do that. So we're starting by creating a tool. Ooh, let's do it right way and put some commandlet binding in there. I'm just trying to keep this really, really simple. So I'm not going to do anything like pipeline input or anything like that. You could obviously do all those things. This session is not supposed to be about building awesome advanced functions. The point is that you want to build this thing so that it produces a single type of object as its output. And you want to make sure that that object has a, a timestamp property of some kind. That's why you're typically not going to just run a straight command like get WMI object. You, you could, I'm not saying it's impossible to, to do what you need. This is a little bit more structured. So I'm just retrieving all of the local disks from the computer. Now it is very likely that there could be more than one local disk on a computer. So I'm going to need to enumerate those as well. And now I need to construct my output properties. And I've simply been careful to make sure that one of the properties I include in here is a timestamp. Keep in mind, all of this data is going to be just dumped right into SQL server. So it's important you be able to differentiate. That's why there's a computer name. I know what computer this particular row came from. There's a drive letter. So that's the device ID and a timestamp because I'm going to be periodically updating this data and I want to keep the historic data. I'm going to need some way of making sure I can tell which one came in which order. Now, the reason I'm being careful to create this new object and place it into a variable, one of the requirements of this tool I'm showing you is that your objects have to have a specific type name. It's important that the type names start with the word report and then a period 
and then a single word that kind of describes what it is you're producing. Then you can output that to the pipeline. I'm going to quickly save this. Uh, we should really make a module out of it. So let's make a, a little module right here. So now I should be able to run this get disk info right from a PowerShell command line. Okay, so that works. Now in theory, you could give it a comma separated list of however many names you wanted to. You could read computer names from a file. There's a lot of different ways you could get computer names into that parameter. The important thing is to verify that it's producing the data I want. I've got my free space, I've got my size, I've got my drive letter, I have the name of the computer this came from, and most importantly, I have a timestamp. So here's the cool thing. Once you have it producing the right data, what did I call that? Save report data. Save report data, local express database name, PowerShell. Keep in mind, so there's a little bit of trick magic that's going to happen. Just before I hit enter, I'm going to go back to SQL Server Management Studio. And if you look at the PowerShell database, that's what's highlighted right now, and then look at the tables folder, which is what's highlighted now. There is no table in which to store this data. Data has to go into a table. A database can hold multiple tables. Right now, there's no table. So let's minimize this. Hit enter. I have some debug output in there just to make sure this thing is going to run. And it looks like I got no errors. So now I'm going to go back to SQL Server. Refresh, and you will notice I now have a table called disk info. That name came from the object type. I called it disk info over here in the script, and that's why it's a disk info table here in SQL Server. Furthermore, if you expand this and look at the columns, It looked at the object's properties and it created a computer name column, a drive column, free space, size, and timestamp. And it even did a good job of guessing what data type they were. Computer name and drive were strings, so it creates those columns as NVAR cars. Free space and size were numbers, and so it created them as big ints. Timestamp was a date time, and so that's what it created it as. Now, it has no way of knowing how big to make those fields, and so it, I, I, I've coded it to just kind of make a good guess, but the idea is to make this total brainless for you. You don't have to think about it. Now let's select the rows out of the table, and you can see that it did, in fact, populate the correct information. So I'm going to swing back over to the... Uh, the console here, and I'm going to run that command a couple more times. Oops. We'll come back into SQL Management Studio, and I'm going to close this or run this query again. So you can see that I've got a row for each time that happened, and the timestamps are just um, because I just ran them all right in a row. The timestamps are all very slightly different, but that's all we need is some slight difference. Now, if you ran this in a production environment every day, once a week, whatever else, then this is obviously going to stretch out a little bit more. Uh, a great comment. This looks really simple. I've always avoided saving to SQL since I thought it was more complex. Um, it isn't. And even though this module is doing a lot to make it simple, let me show you what this module is actually doing. Over here on save report data, the first thing I'm doing is simply creating a connection string. Now, if you gave me a connection string, I'll use it. But what this highlighted code is doing is saying, if you used local express database name, 
I'm simply using that to construct the appropriate connection string. I create a new connection to SQL Server, set its connection string to whatever the connection string is, and then I use some error handling to attempt to open that. If that doesn't work, I'll throw an error. For each input object, I first check to see if the database already has the necessary table. So there's a test database function a little bit lower down, and that's what actually goes through and sets up a new table for you. Honestly, you could do that manually. My goal was to just make this easy. I'm using get member to determine what properties the piped in object has. So you can see, I'm, just like you would run get member to see what properties something has, that's all I'm doing here. And then I'm dynamically constructing a SQL statement. Now, this is an important point. This is designed as an internal tool to be used by administrators. This is not something that's made available to the public. So things like dynamically constructing a SQL statement, I feel is reasonably safe since only a trusted administrator should be running this. This is completely open to types of attacks called SQL injection because I'm not expecting you to ever expose this to somebody who might be malicious. And then I'm just running through each of the properties and I'm constructing an entire SQL string. And at the very, very end of this, if you ran it with minus verbose, it would show you the SQL statement that it had prepared. I create a command, connect it, give it the command text, and I execute the query. And that's it. The SQL stuff of this is really just these lines that do the command and the lines up here that open the connection. So if you look at this, there's really only six lines of code necessary to talk to SQL Server. Seven if you include closing the connection afterwards. So let's do this one more time back in the console. And I'm going to run it with minus verbose this time. You can see that it's displaying the, oops, didn't mean to hit A there. You can see it's actually displaying the SQL language that it's running. Here's the insert command. Oops. So let's go a little bit further down and look at that test database. This is connecting to the database that you specified. It's simply checking to make sure that the database you specified exists if it does not exist, so this is where it's testing to see if it exists. If it doesn't exist, it constructs a create table statement, and this is how it actually creates the database that you asked for. Uh, good question from Jason. Do you keep all the functions V2 compliant or do you need to be in V3? I think I actually wrote this back when V2 was a thing, and I think this entire thing will probably run fine under PowerShell version two. I don't think there's any hard dependencies on version three. So this should all work in version two just fine. Uh, and Reese asks, do I need to have the management console or an extra SQL related module installed? There are no other PowerShell dependencies. I do not need the SQL server PowerShell module. I'm not interested in it. All this is using is the core.net framework stuff. And you know you have that because PowerShell needs it to run. Uh, you do not need SQL Management Studio installed. The only reason you might need Management Studio is if you're going to be creating a database yourself. Now, when you get SQL Server Express with advanced services, it comes with Management Studio. However, if your plan is to save your data on an existing SQL Server and you have a DBO who can create that first database for you, that's all you need. You do not need any other tools installed locally. One of the reasons I made sure there were no dependencies is if you want to run this on a server like server core and you don't want to have to install tools, you don't have to. This thing runs entirely on its own. So I'm going to minimize the ISE. I'm going to hop back into management studio real quick and run my query one more time just to verify that I've got data going in here. And just to make our next bit more interesting, uh, let me close this and I'm going to requery this so I can edit the data. Now this is a little, this is a little bit of a tricky bit. 
Uh, but what I'm going to do is modify some of my free space numbers. So let's just do this. And that way my database gets a little bit smaller over, or my, my disk gets a little bit less free space over time. It'll just make for a more interesting experience when we go to play with the reporting. So minimizing this, when you install SQL Server and set up reporting services, one of the tools that gets installed on your computer is this reporting services configuration manager. Now, if you're already using an existing SQL Server instance that has reporting manager or reporting services installed, you don't need to mess with this. The only use of this tool for me right now is the report manager URL. So right here, uh, this is, does not require internet information services. Reporting services has its own embedded web server, and I just need to know where it is. And so this is giving me the URL for that. Now that I have put my eyeballs on that information, I don't need this anymore. Going to that URL gets you something like this. This is not where you design your reports, but it is where you store them all. So I'm going to start by creating a folder. And now I can go into this folder and for right now, this is all we need to do in this web interface. I'm going to minimize Explorer, and then the next tool I'm going to pop open. Oops, I need to go find it. Here we go with the Start menu. Is the Report Builder. I'm going to start by running through this wizard mode for this thing. So I'm just going to wait for this to, to catch up. Um, is it possible to run a SQL query against a particular database from PowerShell and then save the output of the query in SQL reporting? SQL reporting is not a data store. You do not store data in SQL reporting. SQL reporting services pulls data from an existing database. So if you already have a database, there's no need to run PowerShell stuff so that reporting services can get to it. It's not like you have to take the data from one place and put it somewhere else. What I'm doing is showing you an easy way to get information from anywhere and put it in SQL Server. Once it's in SQL Server, PowerShell's role is finished. You don't need PowerShell once the data is in SQL Server. Once the data is in SQL Server, you're going to run through this exact process I'm about to show you. So I'm going to do a chart wizard. And I need to create a data set. <clears throat> in other words, I got to tell this wizard where my data lives. Let's create a new data source connection. And I need to provide it with a connection string. You can also use this builder. MOC is the name of my local computer. SQL Express usually installs itself to a named instance called SQL Express. So it's server name backslash instance name. I know I got it right because it was able to list out the databases. Always click test, make sure it succeeds. Always click test. Okay, I can't have a neat name like that. successful. So now it knows how to get to my server and how to talk to that particular database. So the tables we've got to work with include disk info. Let's just take all of the data and include all of it on the report. Nice and simple. So over on the, the right hand side here are the fields that are going to be part of my report. Now, if you want to test that before you go any further, just run the query. There we go. Ran the query, looks like it's working fine. Make this window just a little bigger. Let 
And you can get super complicated with these things if you need to. I don't really think I need to get much more complicated than just picking these things out. Uh, so we'll go next. Now, what type of chart do we want? Let's do a line chart. So what sort of data fields do I want on the chart? Uh, and it says for most chart types, a field in the categories list is displayed on the X axis. So that might be size. And then a field of value in the values list is displayed on the Y axis. Uh, and so that might be time. Oops, time. Uh, and then I might break those down into different series for computer name and drive. This is not unlike building a chart in Excel. The, the terminology around this is pretty much the same. It's just being done in a different way. We'll hit next. All fields in the chart value must, uh, well, I don't want to do that then. Get rid of that. We'll put that in the series. Oh, fine. Let's sum the, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Let's put size and values. I don't know how this is going to turn out, but we're just going to play with it. The neat thing about this is once you're through this wizard, which is a little frustrating, uh, you can customize this thing a lot easier. So then we get a chart. Um, yeah, that looks fine. What do you like? Green. Yeah, let's go with green. There's our chart. Now this represents a page. So you're probably going to want to blow this thing up a little bit. You can already see how this is starting to, to come out in terms of uh, uh, how it's going to organize everything. But, you know, I think we're just going to take a look at this and yeah, let's just run it. Yeah, okay. So this is my C drive on localhost. We've got the access title. There wasn't enough change for this to really draw an interesting line. Honestly, this is exactly where you, you spend a ton of time is designing this thing. Now, we might come back and play with this in a little bit, but assuming you have spent several hours playing with your report and you have it looking the way you want, your next step is to save it. Now, this just saves it on the local file system. Because I want to make sure we kind of get through this entire sequence of events. So I'm going to minimize this. We can come back to that later. But you can see here on my desktop, I actually have the RDL file. That's report definition language. This does not put it in SQL Server reporting services. I'm going to go back to that website. Remember, I created a folder called PowerShell reports. Well, now I'm going to upload a file to the PowerShell reports folder. Uh, do, 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 do. So I'm uploading that disk report file that I just saved. Now that report has been saved in SQL Server reporting services on whatever server that is on. And potentially anybody can now come in here and subscribe. Now look what happens. I told you I was running the express version of SQL. Sorry, we don't do subscriptions in this edition. You've got to pay for it if you want to do subscriptions. But the point is you could publish the URL to this folder to your entire organization or to whoever wants to see it anybody would be able to come in and subscribe, download the report, or do anything else. They could also, and this is neat, they can create their own report called a linked report that draws data from your report. So once you've put a basic report up there, if somebody comes along and says, oh, I'd really like to have another report that has something similar, you can say, no, 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 that's fine. You don't need me for that. Create your own damn report. I'm busy. If we run this just by clicking on it,
you can see it's going to deliver the oh cannot create a connection cannot oh, ah yeah so here's the trick um i didn't set up reporting services correctly it's tr reporting services is trying to connect as administrator and on my machine right now that account is actually disabled if I go in and enable it, it'll work okay. But you can see that it's actually trying to deliver the report right here in my web browser. And then I now have a button right here in the toolbar that actually lets me download the report to any format I want, PDF, CSV, Excel, Word. You get a whole ton of, of options there. So again, I'm not a huge report generation person. I'm a big get the data into SQL Server and then let somebody else sit around and develop reports. And using PowerShell is a very, very easy way to get data into SQL Server. And the SQL reporting module that I created, which is free and you're welcome to use, makes it even easier to get the data into SQL Server. You just have to follow a few basic rules. So I'm gonna pull the ISE back up real quick just kind of reiterate some of those. And I want you guys to start pumping in the questions. So the basic rules are whatever script you're using to collect data has to output it to the pipeline and has to have a custom type name called report dot something. And that something has to be a single word. So I also want to show you real quick, uh, and I need to pull this up from my other screen. So hang on one, one moment. Let's get this over here. All right, we'll wait for that to catch up. If you are interested in a longer walkthrough of this with all the sample code, all you have to do is go get this free ebook. It's on powershell.org. It has got a complete walkthrough of installing SQL Server. So if you've never installed SQL Server before, this walks you through the entire setup process. Um, it walks you through setting up a database if you've never done that before. And if you want to do that on your local SQL Server Express instance, it walks you through using that module and how to create your tools. It even talks about collecting performance data, because I know some folks have questions about that. It does have some caveats around collecting performance data, things you need to be aware of. It also walks you through the entire process. I'm going to flip right to it. Walks you through the entire process of using that wizard to generate your first report, gets the report running. It talks about all the authentication issues and everything else. So this is a complete walkthrough. It doesn't need to be any more difficult than that. Uh, Michael asks, if you were to collect Perfmon data from 100 servers, would you pull the servers from a remote system or have each server post its information into the database? I would probably purchase Microsoft System Center Operations Manager, but if you were to do this, I would probably advise that you have each server post its own information to the database. One of the neat things about SQL Server is it's really awesome at multiple connections. I would probably not use SQL Server Express for that because it does have a limit on the number of incoming connections it can take. But if you're using a real version of SQL Server, having 100 servers connecting and running a query is not that big a deal. Uh, Reese asks, on the report, would you get the choice to choose the machine or drive, etc.? You could certainly build your report so that it grouped different machines. You could have it display all the machines on one report. And there is a way to build reports so that when you run the report, it prompts you for certain pieces of information, like what computer do you want this report to apply to? The reports can be quite complex, which is why there are 800 page books about designing reports in SSRS. Uh, Bjorn asks, can you give some practical examples of what companies are typically using this for in real life? Disk capacity, some folks are using this for performance, um, mailbox utilization on exchange servers, um, storage resource utilization on SharePoint servers. Um, I've seen customers use this for uh, some, some reporting on some of their line of business applications. Also think about this for things other than trend reports. For example, 
Sometimes some of the things you're asked for are, we need to know who has permission to these files over time. Well, it can be time consuming to collect that information. So write a script that collects permission information, puts it into a SQL Server database, and then let people run their own reports off of that. So you're kind of taking information that's difficult to get at, and you're putting it into a place that's easy to get at, SQL Server, and you're letting people build their reports on it from there. Those are all good questions. The point of this is that Excel and even a CSV file is not a database. SQL Server is. And I think the reason a lot of people have stayed away from SQL Server is a perception of complexity. It isn't complex. It does not need to be complex. It is actually a lot easier to put information in SQL Server than it is to put it into an Excel file. Um, another comment here, I'm planning to enter data from an Excel file and create reports against the data. I would probably do that. I would definitely get the data into SQL Server to create the reports against. Um, I would not be messing with Excel if I had my way. Uh, the, um, the problem with programming against Excel is that it's quite complicated, and that's one of the reasons I don't like it. Uh, I would much rather enter information into SQL Server because it is very dynamic and very easy to run. So um, we've got just a couple minutes for more questions if folks have any, but before we do that, let me quickly remind you where some of this information came from. Everything that I covered, including the SQL reporting module, is in the Creating Trend and Historical Reports free ebook on PowerShell.org. Um, just look for ebooks under the resources menu. The report designer or report builder can be found on download.microsoft.com and SQL Server Express, if that's what you want to use, can be found there as well. Um, good question here from BJ. What would I do if I were to take this process and submit ping data to SQL Server from machines around the US to report on bandwidth speeds? Um, you would do exactly what I did. R write a script, run your ping, turn that data into some kind of object in PowerShell, and then pipe it to save report data. Um, putting a timestamp, computer name, or location name, or whatever other data you need to be on the report all goes onto that object. Now, if you want to get into how can I create a function that produces an object like that, jump on the forums on PowerShell.org and ask the question. I'm, I'm sure folks will be able to jump in with some suggestions, and I'll keep an eye out for it as well. The point of this whole thing, though, is that if you're if you are doing a good job of writing PowerShell functions, then they're outputting objects, not text. And if they're outputting objects, all you have to do is pipe those to save report data, and it will put them into SQL Server for you. Literally anything you can put into a flat object can be stored in SQL Server tables. So all you have to do is answer the question, how would I arrange my data into an object? So uh, I want to thank everyone for attending. Please keep in mind, you can find the latest tech sessions on PowerShell.org. Again, we do require advanced registration. We do not sell, rent, or even use your email address from that. The only emails you'll get are reminders from GoToWebinar when the thing is coming up. We will uh, post this as a recording to YouTube. Usually takes a couple days to make that happen. And if you have follow-up questions, and I'll take just a couple more here in a second, please drop in the forums on PowerShell.org. Uh, Bjorn asks, when using Server 2012 or 8.1, you could use to test net connection instead of ping to get objects. And that's a, a really good point, BJ. Um, we do have things better than ping now in PowerShell. Um, Nicholas asks, can this handle complex objects? And the answer is no. This can only handle flat objects. If you need to query complex objects and have a relationship between them, then it does get a little bit more complicated. However, SQL Server is a relational database management system, so you can have multiple hierarchical related objects. They just have to be placed into different tables. So it winds up being multiple operations to SQL Server. Anyway, thanks everyone for attending. Uh, we're gonna sign off now. Please do remember that you can drop into the forums on powershell.org if you have any follow-up questions. Thanks for attending and I look forward to seeing you online.